Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome back to the program Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate. Um, Mark, I wanted to talk about the um, uh, Murphy case, uh, which has to do with um, the idea that the U.S. government, or at least this is a contention by these uh, Republican uh, uh, state AGs, that the U.S. government um, cannot in any way respond to disinformation uh, that is being spewed out, uh, particularly in the time of a pandemic. But before we get to that, um, the past 24 hours, I mean, look, I went to law school for a year. Uh, civil procedure, I was like, eh, that was too boring for me. Um, what has happened over the past... The, the past 24 hours with this SB4, this is the Texas law that says they can run their own immigration services, essentially, even though, last I checked, they're, they're not a country anymore. They're just a state. Um, wh what has happened over those 24 hours? Well, it would actually take us a couple hours to go through the whole list. But basically what happened was the uh, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has tried to let this law take effect or had tried to let this law take effect. The and I just want to remind people the Fifth Circuit is where law goes has, to die. Yes. Extremists. It, 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 yeah. It's Texas, Louisiana. I think one or two uh, is Oklahoma Mississippi. as well. Mississippi. And this is a, uh, um, a, a federal court that is packed with right wingers um, because more often than not, a, a senator from that state will nominate somebody. And uh, if, it, if it's the, uh, you know, if it's a Republican president, then they'll be like, okay, let's put a lunatic on that, uh, on that circuit court. Yes. And there are many lunatics on that circuit court. And uh, two of them tried to put this horrible law into effect and you went over it. I think it's worth just dwelling on like, this really does nullify federal immigration enforcement. This transfers power over immigration policy to the state of Texas. It allows them to intercept, incarcerate, attempt to deport undocumented immigrants in the state. Um, Mexico has said, we actually will not allow you to deport people back into our country. It's our territory, not yours, um, but they can try. Uh, it allows Texas law enforcement to racially profile basically anyone who looks undocumented and demand proof of citizenship, incarcerate that. It, it's, it's, it's a wish list of right wing fever dream stuff at the border, right? So the Fifth Circuit, surprise, surprise, allows the law to take effect um, a couple of weeks ago, but it does so in a way, and this is where we get into the weeds, it issues what's called an administrative stay, okay? An administrative stay is supposed to be like maybe 24 hours, 48 hours, a court is considering a case, you know, it hasn't decided what it's gonna do, it's just like a very brief stopgap thing. The Fifth Circuit has started issuing them for weeks and months at a time because it is unclear whether the Supreme Court can review and reverse administrative stays. So what the Fifth Circuit has begun to try to do is issue these stays that are only supposed to last for like a day, have them last for like three months, and then claim that there's nothing that the Supreme Court can do about it because it's just docket management and that it's just this little procedural quirk that the supreme court has no say over so that's what that leads us to yesterday right so the united states government the department of justice the biden administration they run to the united states supreme court and they say this can't possibly be right you need to lift this administrative stay you need to uh, allow this uh th this uh, keep this law blocked you know, allow us to prevail on our arguments at this stage. The Supreme Court refused to do so. And the reason why is because, as Amy Coney Barrett and Brett Kavanaugh put it in a separate opinion, they blessed the Fifth Circuit's gamesmanship. They said, oh, well, this is just an administrative stay. It's not a real order. And so we can't do anything about it because we are powerless to step in and overrule an administrative stay. At the same time, Barrett and Kavanaugh sent this message to the Fifth Circuit saying, hey, we're going to play your game for now, but we want you to know that we see what you're doing and we don't love it and we are not going to tolerate it in every future case. So you better get your act together and stop trying to turn yourself into a miniature Supreme Court and start doing things by the book. The Fifth Circuit got the message and within a couple of hours had reversed itself 
and put the law on hold, which leads us to this moment when SB4 is fully on hold because of this insane sequence of events that I think just shows that there are now competing factions within the judiciary, like the super Trumpy people and the merely conservative people, and they are now fully engaged in a hot war over control of the rule of law. And that and, and that's playing out like in um, between the Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court, or at least elements of the Fifth Circuit. And didn't like, do I have this right? Because yesterday when I started the show, Alito had had uh, done what? Like as an individual, like that's the thing I got really confused about because by the time I finished the show, it had been reversed again. And I, 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 I couldn't for the life of me follow what was going on. So Alito is the circuit justice assigned to the fifth circuit, which means that when there's a case that comes up from the fifth, the fight in fifth, as I call it, uh, the circuit justice who is Alito here gets to issue a temporary pause while the full court contemplates what to do. So here the fight in fifth actually only gave the Supreme court like a week to decide whether or not to freeze the law. This was more gamesmanship trying to kind of just, just ram the court into action. Um, and so Alito paused it, but he decided instead of just doing an indefinite pause, which is what the other justices do, he decided to do a rolling pause that he would renew every week. So he would be like, all right, it's on hold until next Tuesday, and then I'll reconsider it. And uh, this week, earlier this week on Monday, when the when the previous hold expired, he forgot to renew it for four minutes. So SB4 was technically in effect for the four minutes that Sam Alito forgot to renew his pause of the lower court. And then he remembered renewed it, it stayed on hold until yesterday when the Supreme Court said, okay, the Fifth Circuit has defeated us. There's nothing we can do. SB4 is now in effect. What a crap show. It's and a crap it really show. Does, it doesn't make it, any sense. It's a terrible way to run a railroad. guys are sort of like, uh, they're they're applying for the next open Supreme Court uh, that they uh, position they can get, I guess. And They're all auditioning. All of them want to be on the Supreme Court. They want to be on Donald Trump's shortlist for the next round. They think the way to get to the top is to be as extreme and lawless as possible. This is what we call MAGA jurisprudence, right? It has nothing to do with the law. It's really messy. Um, it, it's it's openly partisan warfare. Uh, but they think, I think accurately, that that's what they need to do to catch Donald, Donald Trump's attention to replace Thomas and Alito if he wins this year. Okay, so now the what is uh, the the Fifth Circuit, the, the the full court, I guess, has has issued an actual stay. Does the Supreme Court now have the opportunity to weigh in on this, or what what happens next? So <laughs> the Fifth Circuit has not issued a true stay. Uh, the Fifth Circuit has issued another temporary stay while it considers issuing a true stay. It held oral arguments this morning. It sounds like the panel, it's a three-judge panel, different from the last one. We don't even need to get into the procedure here. It's completely insane. Um, they are going to side with the Biden administration. And so they are likely going to put us before on hold for a much longer time period. So no more of this one week, one hour, one minute stuff. I think very soon the Fifth Circuit is going to say SB4 is on ice. And at that point, Texas will go back to the Supreme Court and say, hey, remember how you ruled in our favor last time? Well, we just want you to do it again and let us begin to enforce this clearly unconstitutional law. Yeah, that's the other thing about it is the underlying sort of issue here seems to be completely absurd that it's even being entertained. Well, th there was a case in 2012 called Arizona versus United States where Arizona tried to do exactly this, which was to usurp federal immigration enforcement authority and, and transfer it to Arizona police. And that was the era of Joe Arpaio. He wanted to be right. able to arrest anyone who couldn't show their papers. This was the notorious papers, please law. Very similar to what Texas is doing. Texas actually goes a little bit further in claiming it can deport people, but otherwise they're, they're clones. And, you know, that was... That was a, uh, a a precedent that remains on the books uh, 12 years later. Like Arizona versus United States clearly is good law, clearly applies to this case. Texas was just openly defying it. And now I, what the Fifth Circuit did by letting this law take effect temporarily is 
overrule the Supreme Court from below, which is the Fifth Circuit specialty. They have said over and over again, we do not feel bound by Supreme Court precedent. We do not feel bound by stare decisis. We get to do whatever we want. If the Supreme Court doesn't like it, they can overrule us, but it's not our job to try to follow precedent. Um, that seems contrary to what I learned um, the subsidiary courts were supposed to do uh, in our system, but I guess uh, it's a new uh, it's a new era. Um, all right. Well, with that said, let's talk about uh, Murthy. What is uh, the Murthy case about? The Murthy case is another Fifth Circuit case. Haunts my dreams, Sam. I'm telling you this. This <laughs> damn court. Um, well, my last thing I have on my list to talk to you about is the changes in venue shopping. Uh, <laughs> but so, but but let's let's talk about this because in the Texas instance. I mean, it makes sense that it's in the Fifth Circuit, maybe, or maybe uh, like we'll we'll talk about that. But let's let's talk Murthy first. Yeah. So here, two Republican AGs uh, in Missouri and Louisiana filed a lawsuit in a single judge division in Louisiana District Court, uh, knowing that they would draw a Trump a Trump judge named Terry Dowdy, who is a notorious anti-vaxer. He wrote this truly insane opinion. Uh, a couple of years back saying that COVID vaccines don't work. He's notorious for issuing these sweeping nationwide injunctions. So these two Republicans go into his court and they say, we want you to issue a nationwide injunction that prohibits the entire federal government from communicating with any social media company in a manner designed to even mildly encourage them to remove or moderate any content involving COVID. Now, the backstory here is that people may remember in 2021, 2022, the Biden administration was working with Facebook, Twitter, a couple other platforms to try to tamp down the rampant anti-vax misinformation at the time, stuff about taking ivermectin to treat COVID, this idea that vaccines caused cancer and all of this dangerous stuff. The White House and, and some other agencies were working with like Facebook to say, hey, this information is wrong. You should downgrade it or you should remove it. And we encourage you to actually put out the facts that COVID vaccines work and ivermectin doesn't. Um, it was not coercive. It was not like do this or else. These were task forces that were set up at the request of these platforms to work in partnership. That was the term the platforms used to try to ensure that they weren't making the pandemic worse. So these Republican politicians decide that that is a violation of the First Amendment. They go to Terry Doughty, the Trump judge. Terry Doughty issues what may be the most sweeping nationwide injunction in the history of the country on July 4th, 2023, a nice little patriotic flourish, 150-page uh, opinion, and he says the entire federal government, the entire FBI, from like the director down to a desk secretary, the entire Department of Homeland Security, the White House, like all of the government, every employee is now personally gagged from ever talking to any social media company about any controversial issue, not just <coughs> coercing them to do one thing or another, but just communicating with them because they are engaged in a relentless and coordinated campaign to shut down the free speech of COVID vaccine skeptics. The Fifth Circuit naturally upholds much of that injunction. That is the setup for Murthy, which the Supreme Court heard on Monday. Uh, I think it's safe to say the Supreme Court is not pleased that it has to deal with this garbage pail of a case. The less insane conservative justices like Barra and Kavanaugh seemed confused how things could go so badly awry in the lower courts. Uh, I think the top line thing here is just that it doesn't violate the First Amendment for the government to tell private companies what it thinks. That is a pretty bedrock rule that the First Amendment only kicks in when the government's engaging in censorship. There was no government censorship here, so there's simply no First Amendment problem at all. I mean, the, there's a couple of thoughts I have on, this, on both sides of it. One is like, where is what? What would be the line? Is one question, and and two, in the event that they found Murthy in favor uh, of 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 this being censorious, um, or a, a, like an abridgment of the First Amendment, like how could the government sort of like meet with business leaders? and say, hey, we think you should start paying your workers more. Like, I mean, I, I wish they would, you know, uh, you know, well, let's put that aside and we'll just, but we hear about this all the time. I mean, 
there was business leaders that went into the White House all through COVID where it was like, you need to start producing more of this stuff and you need to do that. Now, obviously, we're not passing a law that does and we're not going to put you in jail. But this is what we're asking you. How could the government do that if they're not allowed to say to a social media platform, you should police the false information that's coming out? So the plaintiffs in this case, the anti-vaxxers, the Republicans would say, well, what's different here is that the government is trying to censor the speech of third parties. So it's not just that the government is pressuring a social media platform or any other private company. It's that this is a company devoted to hosting other people's speech. And so when the government steps in and says, hey, this says that you should put ivermectin in your eyeballs and it'll cure COVID, you should probably take it down, that that is silencing the free speech of whatever poor unfortunate soul put ivermectin in their eyeballs and posted about it on Twitter. I think the response to that is, and, and this is actually something Justice Brett Kavanaugh brought up, which is kind of funny, but he was White House Staff Secretary. One of the jobs of White House Staff Secretary is to call up newspapers and yell at them for publishing stuff. Say, this imperils the troops, this is wrong, this is too mean to the president, whatever. He actually said on the bench, I give him credit for it, he was like, look, this is what government officials do all the time. They call up the media. They say, I don't like this op-ed. I don't like this piece. You shouldn't print that. You shouldn't print this. No one has ever thought until this case that that is a First Amendment violation. But the attorney, the Louisiana Solicitor General, arguing for the kooks in this case, said, well, that has always been unconstitutional and we just didn't realize it, that it took this case for everyone to understand it. And he said that even mild encouragement, mild. So not not just like not coercive. We're not even talking about coercion. We're not even talking about like enthusiastic encouragement. We're saying calling up a company and saying you should maybe consider taking down this post or not publishing this op-ed, that that alone violates the First Amendment and that courts have to step in and gag any government official who would dare to do such a thing. We should also say that obviously corporations do this all the time. Yeah. That is the, there are people who are constantly hectoring and any type of outlet, regardless of whether it's Twitter or, or what, as to their uh, corporate agenda. Now, of course, they don't have the power of the government, so it's not like a First Amendment issue, but this dynamic exists. So where right. would the line be crossed? So this is something that the Deputy Solicitor General talked about a lot, and I think defended a, like a clear, bright line here. So I think if you call up, if you're whatever, White House Staff Secretary, you know, Surgeon General, you call up Facebook, you say, you should consider taking down this post about COVID vaccines causing cancer because it's wrong. That is fine. Like that seems to clearly fall on the line of not a constitutional issue. But if you add to the end of that, and by the way, our antitrust division is seriously looking at breaking up Facebook for monopoly violations. And if you don't take down this post, then we might have to look into you a little more carefully to see whether we need to bust you up. That that would cross the line into coercion. So there has to be a real threat of some kind of enforcement, some kind of punishment against the platform before it crosses the line. And that follows from this decision from the early 60s that the court kept talking about called Bantam Books, where basically the state of Rhode Island created this commission that was going around to bookstores telling them, nice little bookstore you got there. Wouldn't it be a shame if, if it got shut down because it printed stuff we don't like? That's coercion. I think we all agree. Like... That is a violation of the First Amendment. But nothing of the sort happened in this case. It didn't even get close to that line. And so, again, it's sort of a mystery to me how this case reached the Supreme Court. I, I, the only thing that that is reminiscent of is when I think Donald Trump was saying that about Bezos uh, <laughs> in the, the Washington Post. And he was saying, like, you know, nice uh, company, Amazon, but we should maybe look into that for antitrust or something like that. I mean, he, he literally did that. I think it was. Uh, but apparently it doesn't count when Donald Trump does it. You know I, that's my understanding. Um, all right. Lastly, this change in the there's a federal judicial like uh, rulemaking body, which I was yeah. not aware of, apparently, that has changed the um, process in which you you could venue shop like what it sounds like the um, the Murthy people did in this yeah. instance. I explain that to us and, and just how big of a deal this is. So in a couple red states, Louisiana, Texas, primarily, they have these outpost courthouses in sort of random places like Amarillo, Texas, Monroe, Louisiana. 
they're called single judge divisions, which means there's just one judge who sits in that courthouse. Now, if you only watch TV about the law, that might not sound surprising, but actually federal district courts have many, many judges on them. And traditionally, when you file a case in a federal district court, it goes into the spinner that used to be an actual physical machine. Now it's an electronic thing and is randomly assigned to one of those judges to prevent the plaintiff from picking their judge because it is obviously deeply unseemly and looks very political for a plaintiff to be able to handpick which judge is going to hear their case. The single judge divisions have developed as a workaround to that, a kind of loophole, because these judges are the only guys in their courthouses, and these district courts, under conservative judicial control, have essentially suspended the rule of random assignment and allowed these judges to take and hear and decide any case that somebody files before them. So the Murthy case is one example. Probably the most notorious is the medication abortion case, the Mifepristone case last year, right? That was filed in Amarillo, Texas, not because it had any true connection to Amarillo, but because the Trump judge who sat in that court, Matthew Kaczmarek, was guaranteed to hear the case and guaranteed to rule against abortion because he's a lifelong abortion foe. Uh, the Judicial Conference, which is as you said, kind of obscure, but an important body that sets the rules, has now come out with a rule saying that has to stop, saying random assignment is the rule, there should not be exceptions, and that is especially true when the policy or, or request or lawsuit or whatever involves some kind of nationwide relief, like a nationwide injunction, like a, an injunction against the entire federal government or something like that. That if it's a major case that involves major policy disputes, it has to be randomly assigned. Now, the, the, the kind of stinger here is that no one is entirely sure how the judicial conference can enforce this rule. This is not a body that has traditionally exercised a lot of direct hard power. It's usually more of a soft power kind of thing. And so if these judges in Texas and Louisiana refuse to play ball, I do not know what will happen. The chief justice is the head of this conference and the head of the judiciary. Presumably he can try to kind of like wield some hard power to rein in these rogue judges, but it is going to be a battle within the Article Three judiciary. And at this stage, I cannot quite say who will win. Interesting. And so what is the proposal as to how you avoid, like just if you're a single court uh, justice, you, you're just not eligible to hear this stuff. It's got to go to a bigger, uh, like, like how in practice, um, never mind. Will they enforce it? What, like, what, how do they articulate the rule? So the rule is you might file in Amarillo, but the headquarters of that district court are in Dallas. And so your filing is going to go into the same spinner that every other case goes into and is going to get randomly assigned to some judge who sits somewhere within that geographical district. Okay. Might still be Amarillo, but will probably be Dallas. And that way, there's at least a fighting chance that a more impartial judge will hear the case. Matthew Kaczmarek and Terry Dowdy and all of these goons aren't going to be able to just lay claim to these sort of partisan cases and s use them to seize a whole lot of power from the Democratic branches. Uh, really interesting and very helpful. Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer at Slate, as always, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure.